spray foam is an easy way to insulate an existing home or building. It has a high R value per inch, it can provide the benefits of an air barrier and a vapor retarder, and it can be useful for insulating and sealing hard to reach locations. But is it really the best option when it comes to insulating an older home or building? In this video, we're talking about the risks of using spray foam in remodels, how it can go wrong, when to use it, and how to use it safely so that you're not rotting out the structure. Let's get into it. So, I think we all realize that spray foam is a good insulator. I don't think anyone's going to dispute that. We've used it in the past quite a bit, and I think a lot of professionals use spray foam as a crutch to their own detriment. There was an article that came out towards the end of 2024 about how many UK mortgage lenders weren't providing loans for homes that had been insulated with spray foam, since a lot of existing homes had been retrofitted with spray foam insulation and had started to experience severe rot and deterioration, particularly in the attics. Now, a lot of these issues weren't actually from the spray foam itself. They were insulating the roofs of these older homes and buildings that had leaky roof coverings like slate and tile, which had been installed over wood battens or purlins over a wood structure. Occasionally, there would be an underlayment somewhere in there. They call it sarking, but oftentimes that wasn't the case. But those buildings had been drying out relatively easily because they were uninsulated. But when they started to add spray foam, they didn't address the water management first. Those tile and slate roof coverings were still leaking water, but with the spray foam that was applied to the underside of the roof, that water wouldn't dry out, and it would sit on top of that spray foam layer, saturating the wood and rotting out the structure. Depending on what type of spray foam they actually used, they could have also run into some other issues. Closed cell spray foam has the highest R value per inch, and it's a vapor retarder, which means that moisture basically has no ability to dry out once it gets in there. If they were using open cell spray foam, that open cell foam is highly vapor open, and so the UK isn't exactly a warm climate, and we can get a whole bunch of vapor transmission through that open cell foam, which ends up accumulating on the back side of the sheathing, saturating the wooden components. We can also get problems if the spray foam is applied to wooden components that are in direct contact with masonry or concrete or stone without a capillary break. That masonry wall or concrete is porous and absorbs and stores water, and redistributes that water to any wooden components components that are in direct contact, and a lot of the time we see wooden components that are embedded in these walls. Again, these materials were drying out because of the lack of insulation and the abundant heat flow and airflow. But when we insulate around those wooden components that are in direct contact, they're going to stay wetter for a longer period of time, and they're not going to dry out. We see embedded joists rot out all the time when insulation is applied, whether or not it's spray foam. It's just that the closed cell spray foam makes it harder for things to dry out. This whole moisture problem isn't unique to spray foam. It's all insulations. But closed cell spray foam in particular can cause problems because it severely limits the drying potential. And if it's used incorrectly, we can get a lot of nasty problems. And so we have to address our water management first. Every single potential leak, every single flashing, we want our water management to be impeccable if we're retrofitting an existing home with spray foam. Now, let's say you address all of the water management. Are you in the clear to insulate with spray foam? The answer is maybe. If you're planning to insulate a roof with spray foam, you need to be conscious of the climate zone that you're working in, the type of roof assembly that you're working with, and the type of foam that you're using. If you're insulating a roof in a cold climate, that being IECC climate zones 5 or higher, closed cell spray foam and spray foam in general has a risk of cracking in some assemblies, and if the foam cracks or separates from the substrate that it's being installed over, you've just negated the benefits of the air barrier. And the air barrier is critical in the spray foam's ability to prevent condensation. If you have an impermeable roof covering or underlayment like asphalt shingles on an ice and water shield or a standing seam metal roof over an ice and water shield, we cannot dry through those materials effectively. Closed cell spray foam is a vapor retarder, but it tends to be more permeable than these roof covering materials. And so what can happen is that we can get a small amount of moisture migration through that closed cell foam over the course of a heating season, which accumulates in the sheathing and gets stored. Now, usually this isn't enough to cause any sort of rot, but it does increase the moisture content of the wood, causing the wood to swell. During the warmer months, when the sun hits the surface of that roof, heating it up, that moisture is driven back down and out of the spray foam, and sometimes this change in moisture content can be so rapid due to the temperature fluctuation that the wooden components will contract substantially, causing the spray foam to crack. Now, if we have a crack in that spray foam, air can leak inside and condense on the underside of the sheathing. But now, that condensation doesn't dry out nearly as easily because the closed cell spray foam is a vapor retarder and it has a high R value per inch, and we get roof rot. 
Open cell foam can also cause similar problems, except the open cell is vapor open and will cause moisture to accumulate a lot faster. So we limit the use of open cell spray foam to warmer climates, and we try to provide a passive means of moisture removal at the ridge using a vapor diffusion port so that we don't get that moisture accumulation. If you're looking for a guide to retrofitting an existing home with insulation and improving energy performance without compromising durability, get my guide to moisture management for residential remodels in which we discuss how to safely insulate and address a wide range of existing building conditions. That's only available at asiri-designs.com shop. Now back to the video. Spray foam is also not suitable if you're dealing with a high humidity interior environment, like an indoor swimming pool, as the excessive outward vapor drive will inundate these assemblies and accumulate in the wooden components, again, especially around roof assemblies where we tend to have impermeable underlayments and roof coverings. You also have to be careful when you insulate old masonry walls, whether or not you're using spray foam, but spray foam, again, adds some major complications. If you're insulating an old mass masonry wall in a cold, wet climate, we have to deal with the risk of freeze-thaw damage, in which we get spalling or crumbling of the masonry due to osmotic pressures created by subfluorescence or salt deposits that are left behind when the water stored in the masonry freezes. By insulating with closed cell spray foam, the masonry walls stay colder since they're now thermally isolated from the interior and they dry out more slowly because the closed cell spray foam is a vapor retarder, both of which increase the risk of freeze-thaw damage. And at the end of the day, this comes back to water management, but we can't always guarantee good water management when it comes to a mass wall that's designed to absorb and store water, so there's a lot of nuance when it comes to using spray foam. Now, where might spray foam be appropriate in a retrofit or remodel? Instead of using it on the inside, we actually recommend using a very high-density closed-cell spray foam to retrofit old, low-sloped roof assemblies from the exterior. A lot of people don't realize that this is possible, but we actually think that this is one of the best uses for spray foam, especially in retrofit applications. Oftentimes, during a re-roof of an old, low-sloped, or flat roof assembly, the building owner will want to insulate or be required to insulate the old roof assembly. Now, if you're familiar with flat roofs or any unvented roof assembly, there's a lot of components that go into it. You need an air barrier installed over the structural deck or sheathing. You need a few layers of rigid insulation. That insulation needs to be tapered or sloped towards roof drains or gutters. A lot of the time you need a cover board over that rigid insulation to provide a stable substrate for the roof membrane, and that has to be fastened through the rigid insulation layers. But we can simplify all of that just by applying this high-density closed cell spray foam over the existing roof deck. And what's nice about this strategy is that you can create a slope on the roof with that spray foam to give it a positive pitch. We don't need any additional membranes except for that primary roof membrane, and we address all of our potential condensation problems with this strategy. The roof membrane is usually backed with a polyester fleece or felt, and that's adhered to the surface of the foam using a polyurethane foam adhesive. So there certainly are uses and applications for spray foam, but you have to address bulk water management. You have to allow things to dry out if they get wet so that we aren't trapping moisture between that spray foam. And we have to make sure that the spray foam is thermally stable. Now, there's other issues with spray foam, both in the manufacturing side and in the application side. Imperfect application of spray foam is a very common reality, especially since there's so many variables that go into mixing the A component and the B component on site at the right application temperatures and the right preparation of the substrate, a lot can go wrong with spray foam, which is why we tend to avoid it in most cases nowadays. We have a bunch of other videos on our channel discussing the other options that you have to successfully insulate an air seal without the use of spray foam. If you found this video helpful, make sure to leave a like and subscribe for more weekly building science videos and head over to our website at asiri-designs.com where we have over 150 free building science articles that cover a wide range of topics. Links will be in the description below. For now, good luck with your projects. Cheers.